coming up next on Making Moves. JTA starts work on a small but life-altering project on 5th Street in West Jacksonville. When it's complete, families will no longer have to deal with flooded streets, inaccessible yards, and dangerous road conditions. I think it's the best thing that this, that's happened to this neighborhood in 40 years. More advancements for Jacksonville's transit system as JTA's first zero emissions electric buses arrive. Karen Adams reports on why this new transit option is so significant for the future. It's going to be connected, it's going to be autonomous, and it's going to be electric. It's going to be sustainable. New transit supportive developments are coming to a neighborhood near you. Why building around transit makes perfect sense. A former presidential candidate is the new U.S. Secretary of Transportation. We'll tell you what his former opponent for the White House and now his new boss had to say about him. And Bill sits down with the new JTA board chair, Ari Jolly, to get her take on the pandemic, autonomous vehicles, JTA's future, and what drives her seemingly endless enthusiasm for the JTA staff. You know, the men and women at this agency that I've come to know care about their community. You know, they show it, they've, I've seen them demonstrate that time and time again. These stories and more are all coming up right now on this brand new episode of Making Moves. Welcome to Making Moves. I'm Bill Milnes. Glad to have you with us. We begin today in the construction zone. Work on the smallest project of JTA's Mobility Works construction program recently began on 5th Street between the Paxson School for Advanced Studies and the Coca-Cola bottling plant. But at JTA, smallest doesn't mean less important. For the people in this neighborhood, this project will be life-altering. As Making Moves correspondent Vicki Pierre reports, when this project is complete, not only will there be a new road and new sidewalks, it's what won't be here that might be the best improvement of all. Stagnant water, flooded ditches, and impassable walkways. It, uh, the pond will fill up, you know, the drainage, and, and it just, it's, it's just really bad, the mosquitoes and also. For those who live along this stretch of 5th Street, this is the norm every time it rains. But at the site of these construction crews, residents say they have hope. I think it's the best thing that this, that's happened to this neighborhood in 40 years. It's way overdue. It, it's past due. This construction comes thanks to JTA's Mobility Works program, and officials agree it is long overdue. Improving this road was originally part of the city's Better Jacksonville plan, but those plans were put on the back burner due to a lack of funds. But with JTA stepping up to the plate, this project is back in business and this road on track for a much needed overhaul. And they have just been elated. Finally, um, they are seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. You don't have to worry about if it rains, will I, will I be locked into my house because I cannot, you know, get to the roadway or my car gets stuck. JTA Design and Construction Project Manager Angie Williams tells us the infrastructure on this road is more than 100 years old. With this work, those who live and travel along 5th Street between Melson and Huron can expect to see some major upgrades, including drainage, water, and sewer improvements. Thinking about if you have to go to work and you cannot access a bus because there are puddles of water right outside of your house, that's not a condition that um, our community should live in. This project isn't just about helping residents through rain and flooding. It's also about protecting them from traffic. This is a heavily traveled road with a lot of big trucks and cars, and sometimes pedestrians don't have a place to go. But with the installation of new sidewalks, new bike paths, and a three-lane road with turn lanes, residents are already starting to breathe a little easier. 
kids out here play all the time. It's just too dangerous. The cars almost hit you. There's nowhere to, you know, go if, except for in a ditch. It'll most definitely make it better. Uh, <laughs> Definitely for the pedestrians. We really need it, especially the elderly and, and like the, the kids walking down, you know. You can just walk and ain't got to worry about looking behind you to see a, a, if a truck or a car coming. This work marks the third and final phase of work taking place along 5th Street and McDuff with the projected date of completion at January 2022. When it's all said and done, William says these improvements are more than just cosmetic. They're about accessibility and a better way of life. A lot of people think about JTA as just being a bus company, and we're more about being a bus company. There's no sense in having buses if the people that need to use our buses can't access them. And this is about making a good community and making transportation accessible in Jacksonville. In West Jacksonville, Vicki Pierre, JTA Making Moves. On our last show, we told you how KIPP Public Charter Schools agreed to a 40-year lease to build a new school on JTA's Gulf Air property. Construction on the school is currently underway. It's called Transit Supportive Development, where public transit plays a key role in the development itself. With the new KIPP school, the Gulf Air location is supported by a First Coast Flyer Green Line station right on the property. Now JTA is in the final negotiations with Corner Lot Development Group for another transit supportive development. This one in San Marco, adjacent to the Kings Avenue bus and Skyway station. The JTA Board of Directors gave the go-ahead for CEO Nat Ford to negotiate and execute a lease with Corner Lot for a nearly four-acre parcel between Montana Avenue and Broadcast Place near the South Bank. Corner Lot plans to build 340 multifamily residential units and retail space with structured stormwater and parking, activated green spaces, connectivity to the Kings Avenue Transit Hub and Skyway Station and the surrounding community. The proposed lease includes a 40-year initial term with an additional 40-year renewal option. Meanwhile, in South Jacksonville, it looks like business will be picking up at the Avenue's Walk Transit Hub over the next year. The Bainbridge companies are building a new multifamily development directly adjacent to the JTA hub there. According to Bainbridge officials, the original build includes 372 units with up to 1,050 units permitted for the 112-acre site. I'm told the design will be identical to its Axis Wellington Park development in the Palm Beach area, only with a different color scheme. This will be the second Bainbridge development in Jacksonville, but the first connecting to a transit facility. When the new development is complete, the potential for new ridership on JTA's First Coast Flyer Blue Line and other routes that service the Avenues Walk location is absolutely huge. That Avenues Walk site was also built with a long-term goal of serving as a future commuter rail station. That's something the future residents will sure be thrilled about. JTA marked a new milestone in its transit evolution when the authority received its first ever zero emission battery powered electric buses. Making Moves correspondent Karen Adams shows us how these buses are different from anything else in the JTA fleet and why adding them is so significant. JTA is making strides to get its fleet of buses up to the most technical and futuristic standards. The benefits will help bring JTA into the green age by having buses with no emissions or pollutants. JTA's CEO says the buses are yet another milestone the transportation company is achieving. In terms of uh, the, the zero emissions and dealing with uh, greenhouse gas emissions and sustainability in our environment, it's important that uh, public transportation or transportation in general looks at alternative fuel sources that allows us to have zero emissions. Mark Benston is the director of maintenance for all of the buses JTA owns. He says the new technology has all of his mechanics excited and looking forward to servicing them. For us, the first thing that we're going to notice here in maintenance is uh, uh, our reduced maintenance inspection costs. There's, there's no oil to change on them. Uh, the, the inspection, we can bring them in pretty much, just look at them. There's, there's no maintenance on the, on the bus, on the, uh, the batteries itself. So what will riders notice with these new buses? Benston says not much, as they'll look similar, but they just won't be as noisy at all. In fact, you might not even hear them approaching. Well, they won't notice anything much different because, because they all look the same as our CNG buses. What they'll notice about them, they'll, they'll be a lot quieter than the CNG or diesel buses. 
Right now, JTA has purchased two of these all-electric buses with zero emissions, which will be great for the environment. JTA will evaluate this for the next year, and if necessary, and if things go as they expect, they will be buying more. JTA riders will see the new buses only on a specific route to start. It'll be Route 82, the Amazon shuttle. Part of the reason they'll be on a shorter route is because, being all electric, the battery life can only power each bus about 150 miles before it needs to be recharged. There is a major challenge in terms of our service area and the wide, the very large territory that we're covering. And so as we look at introducing these vehicles, we'll look at range, we'll look at where we need to have charging stations so we can make sure that these vehicles are properly charged. The battery technology is evolving, and so as it evolves over time, we're expecting a point that uh, introducing electric vehicles to, to our entire fleet. The long-term goal will be to get more charging stations set up around the city as more electric buses are purchased, a true sign of the times to come. As our nation and the city of Jacksonville starts to become less dependent on fossil fuels and more dependent on clean energy. In Jacksonville, Karen Adams, JTA Making Moves. JTA's Ultimate Urban Circulator, dubbed the U2C, is one of the more exciting transportation projects anywhere in the country. The project, which will transform transit not only in Jacksonville, but throughout the transportation world, keeps moving forward to eventual commercial revenue service in downtown. Two teams have submitted proposals to build Phase 1 of the plan, the Bay Street Innovation Corridor. Selection is expected to be finalized this summer. The winning team of companies would then begin to design the actual system which should take approximately 18 to 24 months. Full commercial revenue service of autonomous vehicles on Bay Street is expected no later than 2025. That's a mere four years away, and frankly, I'm told it could happen even sooner. The Bay Street project is more than just autonomous vehicles. It's an innovation corridor. JTA is partnering with the North Florida TPO, the city of Jacksonville, and JEA to use the latest technology to enhance the usability of the corridor. Now here's a look at the two teams competing for the Bay Street contract. Team one consists of Balfour Beatty Construction as the design lead and project manager, Superior Construction Company Southeast, Beep, WGI, Stantec Consulting Services, and Miller Electric would all serve as subcontractors. The second proposal features Jacksonville-based Haskell Company as the design lead, the build contractor, project manager, transportation engineer, architect, and engineer, as well as project oversight firm. The subcontractors would be Transdev, Oceaneering International, To Get There, Siemens Mobility, and Metric Engineering. Still to come on Making Moves, we'll tell you what former 2020 presidential candidate is now the new Secretary of Transportation and take you to the swearing-in ceremony. JTA's new board chair talks about her first five years on the board, the future of transportation in Jacksonville, her interest in the JTA CARES outreach program, and more. We'll be back in 60 seconds with more. Jason, let's go see your room. What do you think? We kept it a little spare so you can decorate it how you like. Excellent. Yeah, I saw you guys out there. We're in the back room. We're in the back room. We're in the back room. Yeah! I thought you were on my team. Wait, okay, you're You're watching Making Moves, the most honored transportation news and information program of its kind in the country. Welcome back to Making Moves. Some national news now. By an 86 to 13 margin, Pete Buttigieg, the former 2020 presidential candidate and mayor of South Bend, Indiana, was confirmed by the U.S. Senate to be the new Secretary of Transportation. I, Peter Buttigieg. I, Peter Buttigieg. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. Vice President Kamala Harris swore in the new secretary, who takes over the job from Elaine Chao.
Buttigieg becomes the 19th confirmed secretary of the U.S. Department of Transportation. His confirmation also has historical significance as he became the youngest cabinet member in history at just 39 years old. President Joe Biden called Buttigieg a patriot and a problem solver who speaks to the best of who we are as a nation. American Public Transportation Association President Paul Scatellis had this to say. We look forward to working closely with Secretary Buttigieg to address the ongoing impacts of the coronavirus pandemic. In particular, we urge Congress and the administration to provide $39.3 billion of COVID-19 emergency funding to help public transit agencies continue to provide a critical lifeline to essential workers and help our communities begin to rebuild our economy. Here locally, the JTA Board of Directors has a new lineup of officers. The board selected Ari Jolly as its new chair. Jolly, a former naval officer, has been on the board for the past five years. Jolly takes over for Kevin Holzendorf, who has led the board for the past two years. We'll have more with the new chair in just a moment. Debbie Buckland is the new vice chair. Buckland was appointed to the board back in 2019 by Governor Ron DeSantis. She is the market manager for Truist Bank. Ray Driver, a founding partner of the Driver, McAfee, Hawthorne and Diebenau law firm, is the new board secretary, while Nicole Padgett is the new treasurer. Padgett is the chief administration officer for Summit Contracting Group, and she's also the president and owner of Elite Tech Solutions. There have been few JTA board members as enthusiastic and supportive as new board chairwoman Ari Jolly. The former naval officer and current senior assistant general counsel at Florida Blue, Jolly has been on the JTA board for the past five years. But now she takes on the new challenge of leading the agency through and hopefully out of a pandemic. I recently sat down with Chairwoman Jolly to get her take on the pandemic, autonomous vehicles, JTA's future, and what drives her seemingly endless enthusiasm for the JTA and its staff. Congratulations on being named uh, the chair of the board. You've been on the board for five years now. Tell me a little bit about what stands out to you about those five years. You know, it's kind of hard to, um, to pick a few things because this agency is just so dynamic. That's one of those um, attributes of this agency that I most value is in that there's constantly some monumental project going on and this agency has been so amazing about bringing those projects in on time, generally under budget or you know, within a, 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 an appropriate um, variable. But if I had to pick some of the projects, you know, the JRTC is clearly one of them. It is amazing to me that within the five year span that I've been on this board, we talked about the concept of building the JRTC. We, um, we, we looked at the, the graphics, the visuals, we you know, talked about the location, um, talked about how to decorate the interior, and here we are within a five year period, we went from concept to completion, and we are off and running, and we already are having such a profound impact on this neighborhood. And all you have to do is come down here to the La Villa area and look at the residential um, developments that are popping up, and I, I dare say in the next five to ten years, you know, this is going to be such a revitalized community. Um, and that's, that's the JRTC. So I think that probably is, you know, the, the most um, significant development in my five years on the board. You talked a little bit about the growth that's going up around uh, the JRTC. And a lot of, I think a lot of people really don't understand what an economic driver this agency is. When you have a hub like this, we're going to probably see more retail around this area, and that's going to fuel growth. It's going to fuel economic um, uh, prosperity for the businesses and the people you know that are operating you know, those those retail stores and you know that are living in these um, residential buildings. And so this is what we what you what you know this is what we call a transit oriented development, and that's one of those things that um, the JTA. Um, is always looking to promote. Where do we build um, a station? Where do we build um, uh, transportation um, connections so that um, we can then see additional growth pop up around that? Um, and, uh, and that in and, in, uh, in and of itself then has a economic impact on the community. Three new developments, the Kip Public Charter School at a First Coast Flyer station along Gulf Air Boulevard in North Jacksonville, a multifamily residential development adjacent to JTA's Avenues Walk Transit Hub in South Jacksonville, and another multifamily residential and retail development next to the Kings Avenue station in San Marco, 
all have transit components and should pay long-term dividends to both JTA and their local neighborhoods. And that's economic growth. And economic growth is the vitality of a community. So um, that, that's what makes an agency like this continue to highlight its value proposition. It's not only getting people to places that they need to go, healthcare, jobs, recreation, but it's also continuing to um, support the economic growth of a community. We've talked a lot on making moves about the U2C and autonomous vehicles. Now the Bay Street Innovation Corridor is, you know, that's in process. One of the more exciting things is that we just got two electric buses in. Um, how significant is that, do you think? And why is JTA looking at also adding electric buses to, the, to its fleet? We need to be mindful of is um, sustainability and you know impact on the environment and so um, the acquisition of these two electric buses will allow us to test the viability of these electric buses and um, hopefully it'll support you know growing our electric bus fleet because if you look at it we have a, a um, mandate to look at how do we operate in a environmentally conscious manner. Do you think Jacksonville's ready for autonomous vehicles? I think, you know, the um, autonomous vehicles are here to stay. I think it's the wave of the future. And I think this community has the courage. And I think it's, you know, it's got the, um, I think it's going to enjoy the, um, the challenge of being, you know, the innovator that um, makes it mainstream. Jolly says she regularly gets questions from her friends and colleagues about autonomous vehicles. How they work, are they safe? Questions she's happy to answer, but she says there is still more work to be done when it comes to educating the public about this futuristic transit option. They do, and, and, and what that highlights to me is that one of our challenges is going to be um, educating the public. What does an autonomous vehicle, how does it operate? You know, um, why, uh, why should we not be worried about safety issues? Um, you know, I think we, that's probably, um, an area that we really have to focus on and we have to um, be very good at is educating the public to understand why these autonomous vehicles are in fact very safe. They take that human element, that, that, um, that lack of reaction ability um, and out of the equation. Um, but there may be other challenges and people worry about, you know, can they be hacked? You know, um, what if there is a power failure? You know, so we've got to be, we have to be able to make sure that, you know, in a, in a um, comprehensive enough yet concise enough manner, we can communicate both the challenges and the opportunities so that the anxiety and um, question, you know, is properly addressed. You've taken a particular interest in the JTA CARES program. I'm kind of why, why that um, area of what JTA does, the outreach has, has kind of caught your attention. You know, the men and women at this agency that I've come to know care about their community. You know, they show it. They have, I've seen them demonstrate that time and time again when we had the, um, the hurricanes that hit the um, Pensacola area. Um, I, I was here when I saw employees bring pillows and other necessary items, you know, that were put on buses to take out to the panhandle. Um, and it is, it is consistent with this agency's um, commitment to our community and to those within our community, you know, to whom, um, who are experiencing hardship, um, either permanent or temporary. And um, I think it's, it, it's part and parcel of our soul. It's part and parcel of our mission is to serve, you know, and, and the, the CARES opportunities is just another um, way of, of making sure we carry through on that. Um, I can't tell you how incredibly heartwarming it was for me um, the last couple of Thanksgivings to be at the South Parker Center and see our employees here um, hand out the baskets with, you know, entire turkey meals um, and other and, and related items. And, and to see the gratitude and um, smiles of the recipients of those baskets. Thanks for being on the show, we appreciate it. When I was your age, I was just like you, fascinated by stars. Wow. 
but now I get to search for life in the universe. And who knows, maybe life is looking for us too. So we're like aliens to them? Yeah. Does anyone want to be a scientist now? I do. Awesome. We need more girls in STEM. Maybe we can find aliens. Time now for another installment of our Arts in Motion series where we feature some of the amazing artwork on display at the JRTC and the artists behind them. Today we feature Aisha Mishkin, who says she's humbled to see her playful artwork alongside the works of other talented artists on the walls of the JRTC, a building she considers to be a work of art itself. I mean, I'm pleasantly surprised that, one, I'm here right now, this is incredible, and you know, that I'm being able to wake up every day and pursue my passion. I came here to go to UNF, like a lot of English classes, and then a couple of the art classes, but I just didn't have the patience to be in their art classes because they were so long, and you know, I mean, I loved every moment of it. And then I moved and was in New York for three and a half years, just taking in all the culture there and one day I just decided I couldn't uh, do the winter anymore so I was ready to come home. So the art thing's always been something that I've done really early on but when I got serious when I got back from New York I think that that's when I realized like you know this is something that's not going away and this is something where a lot of people are encouraging me to pursue it and it's a really scary thing I think to pursue something that's sporadic and like has no rhyme or reason why certain people are successful and other people aren't. But I figured if I was going to do something I needed to do it with like all of my energy and just welcome it in and allow it to grow the way that it needed to grow. So I think when you're young, you have like a lot of different mediums to explore and that's really exciting for people to be able to like see what they're good at, if they're good at painting or pottery or textiles or just, you know, drawing and digital art now. So for me, it was always like I was heavily into illustration and that's like where the main body of my work is. I love that and I love being able to just draw every day and sit down and like zone out. I've always wanted to go into like fashion and stuff. That's like something I was really interested in when I was little. And I realized it wasn't so much fashion that I liked. It was more so the textile part of it. I taught myself how to embroider. Once I picked up a needle, it was kind of like, I just didn't stop. It's really cool to be in a building that one looks like a piece of art and two to have like other artists, you know, surrounded, like hanging next to other artists who are just as talented, if not more. It's very flattering and it feels like, you know, this hard work pays off. And that wraps up this episode of Making Moves. We thank you for joining us and welcome you to check out our YouTube channel where you can watch past episodes and stories at your leisure. And direct links to our YouTube page is available at jtafla.com. I'm Bill Milnes for everyone here at JTA. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.